the pro case for IPT, that's isoniazid prophylactic therapy, should be implemented for all people in the Asia Pacific. And I understand that there are, you know, when I talk to people about this and I've been talking to them for a while, there are some you know, decent reasons that people give. But I think the, scientific, the weight of scientific evidence now is so much that these reasons are really becoming excuses rather than good science-based reasons. So I've called this, IPT should be commenced immediately, or commenced in all people in the Asia Pacific, no more excuses. So a quick look at the global prevalence of TB from the last assessment uh, from the WHO, and what you can see basically is that TB is really a, a big problem in, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as in the Southeast Asia and, and Western Pacific region. So the Asia Pacific is uh, basically high burden countries as are Sub-Saharan Africa. Also a couple of other places, Eastern Europe and Mongolia. So TB we know, and we've heard a lot at this conference, is the leading cause of death in, in people living with HIV in low and middle income countries. It accounts for probably about 25% of all deaths worldwide. It's a major problem. And HIV itself is the strongest risk factor for development of active TB in those who are latently infected. It's estimated there's about a 20-fold risk of developing active TB in people living with HIV. TB seriously compromises outcomes of people living with HIV. Many people are diagnosed with TB as their index diagnosis and then are found to be actually HIV infected and that's probably why they develop TB. And treating both diseases at the same time is complicated it's involved, it, it uh, is, is associated with a lot of morbidity and also mortality. Um, and treating both diseases involves a high, uh, high pill burden uh, and people often do poorly. It can be treated, but there is a risk. Better to avoid it than to have to treat it. And despite being policy for many years now, in fact, for 10 years, it's been high priority WHO. Uh, it's been seriously underutilized worldwide. In fact, I think a couple of years ago, it was thought of the 20 million people who might be eligible, less than one million were actually given IPT. So there seems to be a huge barrier, and the question is why? So excuse number one, and this is a common one, people say, well, I don't want to give INH to someone who has active TB, and it's almost impossible to exclude it. It's too difficult. So this is a summary slide taken from an individual participant data meta-analysis, and those of you who are in the, the, the capacity building session this morning will have, will have heard about this, of 12 observational studies. Okay. In the, all those studies, people with HIV had uh, systematically collected, the investigators systematically collected, regardless of signs or symptoms, uh, clinical symptoms that might suggest TB, they had at least one sput they had sputum, they had at least one mycobacteria culture in order to be eligible for analysis, and their HIV and TB disease status was documented. Okay. Now what this shows is basically they basically got a whole lot of things that you can do at point of care, essentially clinical questions like do you have current cough, which is the C you can see at the bottom here. Do you have a cough at the moment? Do you have a fever? Do you have night sweats and do you have weight loss? They also collected things like hemoptysis and a chest x-ray and they came up with about 20 different possible screening tools that might be useful to exclude TB. And what they found was that if you use a rule that says any, if, if a patient doesn't have a chronic cough, fever, night sweats or weight loss, the negative predictive value, in other words, the amount of people that you can confidently exclude having active TB overall was about 98%. So only two in 100 might actually have TB. Yeah? The others don't. That's pretty impressive for just a set of questions. In Southeast Asia, it was 98%. In Africa, it was very similar, but I haven't shown you that. And even CD4 count low or high at a, at a strata of 200, basically extremely impressive negative predictive value. You can be pretty confident just by asking those questions. And it doesn't have to be a doctor. This is a really eminently task shiftable um, um, tool. Um, and this is, sorry, this is at a TB prevalence of 5%. At a TB prevalence of 10%, the negative predictive value drops a little bit. But it's, all, it's still pretty impressive. The lowest number there is you know, 94 patients out of 100 you can confidently exclude. And these are the sort of prevalences we might expect to see in the Asia Pacific region in general. So in my view, that is an excuse. Now we do have a point of care tool that doesn't even involve technology. It just asks people basic questions, and these have been validated, these questions. Uh, it's really not difficult to exclude TB. So I think that excuse is actually untrue. And I think that science has been incredibly helpful. This was only published uh, seven years ago.
incredibly good study. By the way, it was about 9,000 patients with HIV, so it's a big sample. And it included uh, people in Africa as well as Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam. So the next excuse is that IP, we can't give IPT because it increases INH resistance. And this is fairly old, it's from 2006, but there's actually not been a meta-analysis since. And this meta-analysis was actually done to inform the guidelines for the use of IPT in people living with HIV by WHO, and it was published in 2010. And what this basically shows is when you look at studies which inform that, um, essentially the summary was that there might be about a 45% increased risk of selecting for, for INH resistance by using IPT. So it's not twofold, it's not threefold, it's 50% more. And not only that, and again, people in the, who are in the capacity building sessions today will notice that this confidence interval crosses one. In other words, it wasn't found to be statistically significant. It's possible that in fact there is no difference, but the point estimate suggests it might be up to about 45%. Now there are a few things to think about there, but I think one thing is that IPT promoting resistance, and remember how old this is, and this is mainly in HIV negative people, of course, IPT promoting resistance is a consequence of not having adequate screening tools. So the WHO for years have had a set of tools before that analysis was done that I just showed you, and essentially the most important symptom is if someone had a chronic cough, defined as greater than two weeks, also perhaps that hadn't responded to a reasonable course of antibiotics, then that was therefore TB. And what we know is in HIV that people with HIV what we know is that people with HIV are much less likely to have a chronic cough, partly because it's a porcy bacillary disease in the lung and also because there's a higher incidence of extrapulmonary TB. So it's not, that's not their main problem, it's disseminated. So chronic cough for greater than two weeks in someone with HIV has a sensitivity of less than 50%, right? Not even one in two people will have a chronic cough who have active TB. But now with that new tool, you know, we can exclude nearly everybody who has active TB. All right, so yeah, the other issue is here, as I say, the, t the tool works, so this is actually now should be implemented, and it's a very simple thing to implement. And the other thing is that IPT itself is highly unlikely to select for INH resistance in, long, in, in, uh, in latent tuberculosis, according to estimates of mutation rates conferring resistance to INH. Highly unlikely. By far the greatest contribution to INH resistance is actually in treatment. It's inadequate treatment, poor adherence, incorrect regimens, loss to follow-up, etc. IPT is not the problem, it's the problem of treatment that engenders resistance. Okay, IPT in HLV has no mortality benefit. So people said, well, you know, why give them a drug to prevent tuberculosis? Because they're going to die of cryptococcus or some sepsis of other kinds, so what's the point? Why bother? And that was, that was probably true before the age of ART, but we have to remember now we're treating people. People have access to care, so it's a very different kettle of fish, but the excuse still remains. But there are now some science to back this, okay? So the reality trial that was published only last year that was conducted in Uganda, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Kenya, all countries with a high burden of tuberculosis, uh, had HIV adults and children with a CD4 less than 100. The median CD4 count in this was about 40, so these are very immunodeficient sick patients and they were given either antiretroviral therapy and cotrimoxazole, one double strength daily as per standard guidelines, and then they had an enhanced prophylaxis group who got 12 weeks of IPT, so only three months, 12 weeks of fluconazole, five days of azithromycin, a stat dose of valbendazole, and standard of care cotrimoxazole, one double strength daily. Okay, and what you can see here is at 48 weeks, an impressive decrease in mortality, a very hard endpoint, hard to argue with that as an endpoint, um, a 25% reduction in mortality at 48 weeks, okay? The number of people included in this trial was 1,800, so it's a large sample size, a lot of power to find a difference, and the difference was indeed found. And when you look, when you break down for the particular causes of death, you can see that tuberculosis was reduced, as a, a, new, a new case of tuberculosis was reduced by 33%, okay? And highly statistically significant, at 0.02, confidence intervals as much as a 50% reduction to as little as a 7% reduction. And in this case, a 33% reduction. So I think highly impressive. And now, really, the argument that IPT doesn't prevent TB is debunked, I think, and false. Okay, Temprano. So this is another study that's proven that IPT works. This is a study 
Uh, an impressive study done in one country, the Côte d'Ivoire, with a high burden of tuberculosis, about 200 cases per 100,000 people per year. It was an open-label factorial design RCT, and I'll just go through. So, the, so basically, there were four arms. You either got immediate antiretroviral therapy and IPT, you got deferred antiretroviral therapy, and the deferral was until they'd reached the, guide, the WHO guideline threshold for initiating antiretrovirals. Bear in mind, this trial was done 10 years ago when there were CD4 thresholds. They got immediate ART, ART and no IPT, and they got deferred ART again until they met the threshold for initiation, and they got no IPT. 2, 000, more than 2,000 patients, nearly 10,000 patient years of follow-up, median follow-up time of five years, median CD4 counted entry 477, quite high, right? And what did it find? Well, it found that IPT reduced the risk of death by 37% independent of ART, okay? And when you break it down, that, what that, did, that was independent of what your CD4 count was, and there was no interaction between IPT and ART. And when you look at the breakdown, you wouldn't be surprised that the people who were most likely to die got deferred ART and no IPT, and the people best protected were getting immediate ART and IPT. And you can see that the benefit lasts out to six years, despite the fact they only got six months. So this is durable, right? Because one of the arguments is, oh, people just get TB again. But in this case, they didn't. Okay, because they're immune reconstituting. So even if they are exposed to TB, their chance of developing active disease is much reduced. Okay, oh, by the way, the other thing is that, that was independent of IGRA. So people got interferon gamma, um, gamma release assays, which is a sort of modern form of TST, if you like, um, and PPD, and that didn't seem to have any benefit, didn't have any influence on the, on the risk of death. Okay, so whether you're TST negative, IGRA negative or positive, they all got benefit, and that's important. Okay, so that's an excuse, it's untrue. Okay, IPT is less effective once PL, people with HIV have commenced ART, so just give them ART and they'll reconstitute and they'll get better. And it's true, it is. We, remember we said there was about a 20-fold risk, overall risk? Uh, that's, you know, overall, and mainly in people not receiving antiretroviral therapy. If you give antiretroviral therapy and they're on it long term, you reduce their risk to about five-fold, okay, over an uninfected population, okay? But it's still high, okay? If you even reconstitute sort of with a reasonable CD4 up to 700, which we would think of as a sort of a normal immunity, even then it's about four-fold higher, okay? So it's not true. We do need to still think about tuberculosis because people with HIV, regardless of antiretroviral therapy and good CD4 rise, are at high risk. Untrue. It's too hepatotoxic. Okay, well, here's just two examples. In South Africa, before the era of ART, in, in a particular trial with good follow-up, only one out of 777 patients stopped with an asymptomatic rise in their ALT. Okay, no deaths, no jaundice, no hepatic failure. In the era of ART, again in South Africa, people discontinued on INH uh, at about one point, uh, sorry, on placebo, this is a placebo controlled trial, they stopped at 1.5% even though they weren't receiving active INH. And it was about 3% in people getting INH with about a two-fold rise. So basically, if you take this away from that, there's about a 1.5% of people stopping for an ALT rise. But no one died, no one got hepatic failure, no jaundice, you know, no, no really serious consequence. You stop the INH and they improve. Okay, untrue. Uh, IPT is not cost effective. That's not true. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of economic modelling with the 1 minute 26 that I have left. But basically, if you look in a middle burden uh, country like Brazil with 42 cases per 100,000 or a high TB burden country like Tanzania, which has, a, has a, an incidence very similar to many in the uh, Asia-Pacific region, around 200 to 300. Both studies, which were well conducted and published in high-impact journals, concluded that it was cost-effective to give IPT. This is in the era of ART, mind you, which is the era when we're in. So that's not true either. So just to conclude, basically, if you look um, over the last few years, there have been, uh, since 2009, 10.9 million deaths. And if we'd managed to get IPT into most of these people, which we haven't been doing, it's quite possible we could have presented about four million of those deaths. So, you know, when are we going to act? When are we going to realise that not giving IPT is associated with people dying, leaving their kids orphans, not being able to be productive in the economy? We need to take this seriously. Uh, one modelling study showed that basically the only way we could possibly eliminate TB would be to treat active and latent TB. 
All the other, just treating or doing preventing infection, aren't going to do it. Treating active and latent TB is the way to eliminate this disease, and that's what we should be aiming for, same as HIV, same as viral hepatitis, particularly C. So it's a critical strategy. So in conclusion, it's a high priority. It, IPT works, it's safe. It will not increase TB resistance. Now we have an effective screening tool to exclude active TB. It's cost effective. It will help eliminate TB. It's recommended. It's a high priority policy. IPT should be given to all in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. I thank these two men for some help. <laughs>